Can you name some of these towers? Let's go to number one. Anybody know who, what that is? Oh, interesting. That's the Taipei Tower, the Taipei 100. And that's what brought infamy, actually, to the region. Nobody knew Taipei until the tower went up. Number two, the big one on the side here. Anybody want to take a shot at that? Shanghai. Ah, and number three? The Burj, yeah, the Burj Khalifa. Those towers, so I, I wrote them down. This is actually remarkable. The Taipei Tower soars to 509 meters, 1,670 feet. The Shanghai is at 632, a little bit bigger, at 2,073 feet. The Burj goes up to 829.8 meters. That is 2,722 feet on the lower left corner of your screen. And did you know that Saudi Arabia is now in the race and they're building a tower? It's called the Jeddah Tower. It's under construction. They stopped for a while. It is going to go to 1,000 meters, one kilometer. Now, there's an elevator ride for all of us to get into. Amazing when you think about this. Now, you start talking about towers and monuments, and they're not without controversy. Because there are a lot of people that are actually the detractors because they go, they're destroying, skyscrapers are destroying the skyline. They talk about the historic value of a city. And so there's a number of people when you talk about this, the controversy seems to be a groundswell of people. So you have those that are worried about the historic value. You have the environmentalists that actually talk about how the greenhouse gas emission from the huge skyscrapers, because you've got to heat and cool them, you've got the glass walls, that they're inefficient in their structure. And then you have health experts that are saying we have to watch what we're doing in building the skyscrapers. Now, that was interesting. I didn't know if you knew this, but the health experts are saying that the more that they populate the city with the skyline of skyscrapers, you're creating the shadow effect. So if you've been downtown Toronto or into the Mississauga Square One area, you know what this is about. You end up walking in a beautiful sky, blue sky day like we're enjoying today. You end up walking in shadows for most of the time. And the health experts are going, hey, the vitamin D that we need from the sun is actually being diminished from people who need it the most. And so they're concerned as we crowd more and more. And Dan Trabuco is the head of one of the councils on urban development. And he made an interesting comment. He said, you know, when it comes to urbanization and the need for skyscrapers and for apartment living, he said anything beyond 200 meters is no longer effective because the cost to build above that is actually prohibitive and counterproductive. And so you think about some of these huge skyscrapers that are going up and the housing and developments that are going into them, and he's pushing back saying, if you go higher and higher and higher, you're actually working against yourself. And then he made a very fascinating comment. He said, anything over 200 meters, it's all about the ego. It's about the ego of the person or the company or the city or the organization, whoever it is that's putting it up. He said it comes down to being the ego. And I thought, wow, where did we encounter that mindset before? So go to Genesis chapter 11. And we're going to go back to about 3,000, somewhere around 3,000 B.C. into ancient Mesopotamia. We're going to land on the plains of Shinar in a city called Babel or Babel. Now, if you like the American version, you're going to go Babel. If you're going to go with the sort of the British English version, you're going to go Babel. So, you know, apple, apple, right? <laughs> Doesn't matter. Choose your, choose your poison. We're going to work with it. So we're going to go to the region of Babel, and we're going to have a look at a story in Genesis chapter 11, because here we discover a mindset where ego gets in the way, and there are lessons to be learned. And as we're getting ready for this, I want you to think about this for a moment. When did your ego ever get in the way or get the better of you in maybe your relationships, your job, your career, or just life? When, when was a time in your life when you can immediately think back and go, ooh, that was an ego moment, and you felt the pinch of that? So we're going to go into this story. I want you to look at this because a lot of times we go through on our points of interest series and we look at something like, you know, Babel, and we go, well, why is the story in the Bible and what are the lessons to be learned here? And on this point of interest one, I want you to go back to an era which is post-flood. This is early human history. Post-flood, Earth's population is now beginning to rapidly expand and they are moving out across the face of the earth. And then you reach this point in time where people begin to realize, I don't want to do the rural scattering. I want to urbanize and I want to begin to come together. 
Now, I don't know who came up with the idea. The Bible doesn't tell us who was the person that suggested this. You know, were they nomadic and moving around and somebody said, you know, I'm tired of the dirt and the laundry. And How about we just build a city? Somebody came up with the idea. And when they move towards the building of the city of Babel, there are some profound insights that come out of this story. And so begins the first ever recorded urbanization project, which would include building a fortified city, building a massive foreboding tower, and all surrounded about infamy. Now, I want to put another picture on the screen for you here, because in ancient Mesopotamia, they would build images that look something like this. This is called a ziggurat. It is sort of a square-shaped, stepped ladder type of uh, pyramid structure. And they would build these and continue to build, and they would recess each of the square platforms going higher and higher and higher. And in ancient Mesopotamia, what you need to understand when you see a picture like this, they had this, it wasn't even just a fascination. They had an, a, an obsession with divinity. And they felt that if they could build these high enough with a tower or a shrine or something at the very top, that either they could reach God or God would come and meet with man and there would this, be this blending. And those of you that are, are students of history and you love the ancient history, you will recall that in Mesopotamia, they actually believed that the gods came down and intermingled and had sexual relationships with mankind. And this is this whole perversion that comes out of that history of culture at that time. But this is the structure that is likely in place, something very similar to this when you're reading in Genesis chapter 11. And so God steps in, and he notices that man is not now moving across the face of the earth. Man is now beginning to cluster. And as man is beginning to cluster, man is beginning to decide they're going to build some structures, and infamy is driving this, and ego is getting in play, and they go, we want to have a famous city, we want to have a big tower, and we want to make a name for ourselves. And God says, time out, let's have a talk. And confusion reigns. Now, this is a, a, such a profound chapter for us. This is the hinge section of the Bible because this is where the table of nations begins to emerge. And so if you wondered how we ended up with all the cultures and all the diversity and where we are today, it's back to this story where man was one with common language and God steps in and confusion reigns. Now when I read this story, I have unbelievable number of why questions that it just seems to elicit that. Anybody else? Well, you're going to be bored for the rest of the morning because when I read this story, there's all these why questions around what was going on here. Why did God feel it was necessary to step in and interrupt? Why did God change the language of the people? What was taking place and why should it matter to you and why should it matter to me? And that's always most important to us that we don't simply talk for the act of information. We want to know so that our lives are better as a result of following God and allowing Him to transform our lives. So I want to share with you some lessons of contrast that I'm going to draw out of the story of Babel. And as we draw these lessons out, we're going to apply them to our lives. And I hope on this Thanksgiving weekend, a couple of things will take place. Number one, if you have a relationship with God, you'll just go, God, I am so grateful that your purpose and clarity prevails always. And maybe you're seeking truth and you're not quite sure where to land on the Jesus story. This may help you understand who God is and the faithfulness and his patience in working with man and reaching man. So get your notes. We're going to take a couple of notes, fill in the blanks, and we're going to read some scripture. So let's start off right here. Genesis chapter 11, verses 4 to 6. Let me read it for you. Follow along as I read. And here's what humanity was saying at the time. So they said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. And this will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down and to take a look at the city and the tower that the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Now, this is just like I said, it's rife with these why questions, and you got a sense of is God being rivaled by man? Why does he step in? Why does he feel it's necessary to bring about the change? So let's talk about lessons in contrast. Number one, write it down in your notes. It's the contrast of pride versus humility. It's this whole issue that God is wrestling with with his creation, and we have this propensity in our fallen state to move towards orientation around pride and ego. 
And so God could see that arrogance was going to drive and displace his purpose for man. And it's important to understand the motive. And if you look at verse 4, keep your Bible open as we go through this. Look at verse 4. Come, and here's a key word, a contractive word, let us, let's build. And they want to build two things. They want to build a fortified city and they want to build a tower. Let me focus on the tower for a few moments. Because the tower, as I said, in ancient Mesopotamia had a very, very particular function. Now, there was a security issue in play here. No question. Vast, semi-arid land. If you're traveling and you could see a tower in the distance, how many know it's good to have a beacon light to show you the way home? It's always good if you're in a plane to have that. Now we have GPS. We don't worry about it. But years ago, beacon lights were essential to knowing where to go. We all do this now, don't we? We look across the skyline. We recognize. We look down. I used to be able to look at, down to square one and see City Hall, and now I don't. I just see towers, but I could recognize familiar places, familiar sites. This would be true for the people of this time. If you're nomadic or living in the rural area, you could look off to the city and they wanted to say, hey, there's the tower. We know that that's the city of Babel. That is possible in the rationale, the reasoning behind the building of the tower. Yet the deeper we go into the story, you begin to understand something. This wasn't really around the security nature. See, we can always justify our actions with God, can't we? I can rationalize pretty much anything I want to try to convince God that my motives are pure. But God sees and understands the human heart, and he was looking at his creation, and he knew something, that they were moving towards a course of action that would ultimately be their downfall. They weren't building the tower as an access point for God to meet with them. They were building an access point for them to meet with God. Slight reversal, isn't it? See, God had established the terms and understanding of our relationship with Him. So they're building a tower up to the heavens. Write this in your notes if you're taking notes today. Psalm 115, verse 16. Here's what the Bible says. The heavens belong to the Lord, but He has given the earth to all humanity. That was God's decree. You take dominion over the earth. You rule over creation. You fulfill that function, but the heaven are mine. And here's man going, you know, I'm not really satisfied with the earth. How about if I just take a little bit of shot at heaven as well? And that's what happens. We just inadvertently or purposefully displace God's plan and purpose in our lives, and we see humanity moving in a course of action. So in Eden, pride and arrogance grasp the opportunity to be like God. And in Babel, humanity grasped the opportunity to control God. And we go from this place of wanting to know good and evil. Now we want to go to this place where we're controlling. You see why God has to step in. So a question we should ask ourselves. When are the times in our life when we have attempted to control God? What are those moments where we felt we had the better answer, the better inside moment, and we want God to bend to our will or to our function? See, in our own ways, I think we try to control God. We try to decide the where, the when, and the if we even want to meet with God. And we can say, well, I'm going to choose to be an atheist, so I'm going to choose to control God by saying there is no God. And that's always been the challenge when it comes to our human nature, that we push back against God. And James cautions us. James says in chapter chapter 4, verse 6, that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to who? The humble. It is a contrast. So remember this. Anytime you read Genesis 11, it is a contrast between pride and humility. And in the course of your life, I venture to say almost every day of our lives, you will encounter moments where you're going to have to say, did I put my ego in check? And am I understanding God's purpose in this moment? Or is this me wanting to advance my desire in my marriage, and in my relationships, and in my work. And so often, that's what gets us into trouble. And so when we understand Genesis 11, you begin to see the picture clear. Consider now how far humanity has fallen when we hit this chapter. Back in Eden, we walked with God, and we had relationship. And now here in Babel, we attempt to work our way back up to God, And we are trying to control the relationship. And in Eden, we had relationship. And at Babel, we have religion. Listen carefully. Religion is always man's effort to work their way back up to God. 
and it doesn't matter what name you put on it, religion always attempts to control God according to humanity's definition. And God establishes to have relationship, not religion. That's why the wonderful story of the good news is about Jesus coming in the flesh for relationship with us. But we always, always gravitate towards something that's structured, something that's organized, something that we can control and get our hands around. And I see it in Genesis 11. And if you don't understand religion and the seeds of religion, go back and look at this chapter. Read it again. This is where we constantly struggle. We constantly fall down. On the screen, in your notes, here's what we wrote. Our willful independence will always cause us to self destruct. And in our pride and our arrogance, we refuse to see it. We are blinded by our own ambition. But that willful independence will always get in the way. And so you see this in the building of this tower and you recognize what's taking place. Proverbs 16 and 18, it says, pride goes before destruction and haughtiness goes before a fall. Think about this. If you've read the scriptures or you heard the stories, I just want you to think about this for a moment. Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Darius, Caesar, Herod, all of them built their monuments and their towers. Jesus built a movement, a radical difference when it comes to the focus of the life. So at the end of this, I guess maybe the question I had to ask myself, and you should maybe ask yourself, what are the monuments that we're building in our life? Now, I don't recall seeing any towers in any of your backyards, so I think we're okay. Maybe the odd tree house but I don't remember seeing any towers. But, but what are the towers? Because they're there, aren't they? The monuments of our life. So if we were to just pick them off the top real quickly, you got fame, popularity. I want to be the most popular. I want the most tweets. I want the most social media recognition. I want people to know who I am. So you got the fame side. You got the fortune side. I want to have enough money to do what I want, when I want, how I want, control what I want. And then you move across into the power zone. That's another monument. I want to be able to control people, manipulate people, work the outcome the way that I want to have it. So if I have enough power, then I can control my own destiny. Or maybe it's the pleasure side. I build a monument of pleasure so that I can be self-indulged and my sexual, sensual desires can be pleased the way that I want them to be pleased. See, this propensity of our fallen nature manifests itself in all kinds of monuments. It's just we never call them out. We never look at them. And so what Genesis 11 does when I come to the story of Babel, it forces me to consider, am I building monuments in my life or have I invited God to step into my story and remind me that the monuments I build shouldn't be to myself or to the people around me, but I should be measuring myself against the one who created me and the one who loves me. That's the story that I lift out of this And John reminds us that the world will always give us an attraction, but it'll never satisfy us, 1 John 2, 16. So the second why question when I'm going through this, I ask this. So then why did God confuse common language? Because if the people are always united, and they were at this time, isn't unity better than diversity? And that's really the question that's fundamental in the story. If you've got everybody working together on a course of unity, you would think that unity in this story is a good thing. So unity can be a powerful destiny-defining force when it is founded upon, and get this, when it's founded upon humility, trust, and obedience. But it can be an equally destructive force when it is founded upon pride and ego. And so if you take all of what we wrestle with around unity today in 2021 and move it all the way back to 3000 BC, roughly in that era, and look at Genesis 11 and look at the seeds that are being planted in this moment. The proposed consensus of community that the human group was acting upon was overstepping the boundaries that had been established by God. It was overstepping God's rationale and His reason for humanity in its course. And so here we have human interests saying, come and let us build, but I want you to notice that they were being done in the absence of God. Their unified efforts were based upon the social good for all. Let's build something that's going to make us famous. Let's build something that's going to bring notoriety. Let's be great in our own eyes. But their plans were clearly devoid of any desire to align themselves with God's purpose or God's ideal. And whenever you remove God from the equation, unity 
always gets corrupted. Always gets corrupted. And there are two unavoidable results. And as I just contemplated this story, I wanted to frame them this way. And you may want to just write them down and reflect on them. Here's the first one. Unity that is founded on social conformity rather than spiritual identity will be plagued by intimidation and intolerance. Let me read that again. Unity that is founded upon social conformity rather than spiritual identity will be plagued with intimidation and intolerance because the pressure is to force the mass to conform to the smallest common denominator. And someone is going to feel the pressure in that story. And in the absence of truth, unity begins to feel the pinch and the pain. And we've witnessed this even over the recent years. We've watched cancel culture try to force unity into a conformed social narrative and shut down any voice, any thought, or any opinion that would oppose it. And yet all for the sake and the common good of all. And so here's the the language that we see in Genesis chapter 11. It's good for us to conform together if we are going to transform our society. If we come together and build a city and build a tower, if we conform and agree together, we can transform the world around us. And it seems right. It seems good. But doesn't the Bible first say to us that first we should be transformed and then through our transformation we can conform and become more like Christ and operate more in love and unity? See, it's just a very, very subtle difference here, but it's profound in how it plays out in society. And this is exactly what God could see. What humans fail to see in the moment, God was actually protecting them from what was going to destroy them. The second unavoidable consequence when we try to attempt to control our unity is this. I'll put it up on the screen. When humanity's effort for unity and peace is formed in the absence of God, the result is apostasy. When we make unity our foremost goal and God is missing in the middle of it, we end up leaving God and our spiritual identity is lost. And we see in Genesis 11 over and over, and we see it over and over throughout the course of human history, how this plays out. When we pursue our own interests, we begin to self-destruct. And God could see the seeds. He could see what they were doing, thinking this was going to be a good thing. But God understood something, that the more they forced themselves into this collective community approach, it was going to create fraction and dissension. And God understood that to save humanity, he needed to step in. And diversity and the changing of the languages and the table of nations would evolve out of this this time and frame. And so you see God actually rescuing us from what we thought was our very best efforts. And I love how Genesis 11 states it. God's watching this whole story, and in chapter six, or verse 6 it says, Look, God said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. And after this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. And so God drops in for a visit. And he said, if, if I don't stop them, nothing they put their mind to will be impossible. Now that should cause us to stop and go, wow, our capacity to achieve an ambition is greater than we've ever recognized. Some of us seriously underestimate the capacity that God has given you. And you have capacity because you were created with gifts and opportunity and potential far beyond what you've ever imagined possible. And when the collective group comes together, God's saying, it's powerful. But if it's corrupted, it has the power to destroy. And so for some of us, we need to be reminded that I can do more than I think or imagine possible. And God also says, and I want to remind you that you do it through me, through Christ, and for my glory, not for yours. And I look at the story, and I wonder in amazement, this, uh, you know, the story of, of Babel, it had all the makings of another flood episode. It had one more of those uh, apostasy, apostasy situations where, where I wondered if God re- ever regretted taking the flood off the table. Remember with Noah? He said, hey, Noah, you know, I'm never going to destroy the world again with a flood, and I'm going to put a rainbow up in the sky because that's going to be my promise to you. I wonder if at Babel, God said, shoot, should have kept the flood in the back card. 
Because there they go again. There's that human nature. Aren't you glad God doesn't use floods today? How many times would I have been wiped out by a personal flood if God had decided that's the way to deal with human nature, fallen human nature? How many times would you have been wiped out? But you see God in Genesis 11 in such a powerful way that through His love and through His compassion and through His understanding, He wanted to preserve humanity. And He did it by confusing their languages. And that one just messes up my mind, but in a beautiful way. So that takes me to the third why. Let's jump into there. Here's another lesson in contrast. I want you to write down these words. Our plan versus God's plan. Our plan versus God's plan. See, humanity's plan is always to try to go up. I want to be like God. I want to control God. I want to reach God. God's plan was to come down. And God had always had that as part of his plan from Eden on. He said that there is a seed through the lineage of the righteous that will come down and he will walk among men and he will save them from their sins. That was God's plan all the way through this. And when you read Genesis, if you don't know the full narrative, that's why we're doing the series, Points of Interest, I want you to see the full narrative of the Bible to realize this is not a selected study of history where we go, if you pull it out of its context, it doesn't make any sense, but if you put it in its context, it is incredible because God is saying, I don't want you to destroy yourselves by your greatness because you are great. I created you that way. I want you to build your future according to the design and the plan that I had for you. And in fact, if you're writing notes, I want you to write down Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, because this was the blessing that God gave to Noah. He said to Noah and his sons, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. I want you to fill the earth. And I like what Eugene Peterson said. He said it this way, I want you to reproduce, prosper, and fill the earth. Now, just to be clear, when he said to reproduce, that was in the boundaries of marriage, right? Okay, just making sure, because some of you got really, really excited about that. Like, I love God's plan within the construct and confines of marriage. See, God always puts boundaries in, and we always want to step outside the boundaries. See, God's plan here was he was ensuring the longevity and and moving uh, us towards our posterity, that Christ would come and he would save us from our sins. So how does he save us in this moment? Well, he changes the language. Now, this got me thinking. Did God... Just like that, and all of a sudden we had all different languages. Possible, right? You agree? Nobody wants to weigh in yet because they don't know where I'm going. So he, he could have done that. He could have done that. Or maybe God in his greatness understood something about us, that all I have to do is tweak the dialects a little bit and change dialects just enough so that confusion begins to reign. And so that one word, you drop a letter, you add a guttural sound, and the person looks at them, and you go, what? And you don't really understand that. That happens in English all the time. And those of you that English isn't your first language, I am so sorry. Because there, 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 and there are all the same word, but they all sound the same, but they all mean different things. So there, put that there. No, they're going to put that there. Who? And you do that in construction, and now you have a house that's not going to stand. And so you look at this and you go, so what if God just happened to change the dialect? Now, let me ask you a question. Some of you like reality TV, yes? Anybody watch Rock Solid Builds? Oh, you got to watch this one. This is a story about Randy Strachan and his little construction team of three out in Newfoundland building on the rock. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, now you know the Rock Solid Builds. And Randy and his team, and one of, the, one of his team is a girl by the name of Nikki. If we didn't have English subtitles for the English language, I wouldn't have a clue what that woman was saying. <laughs> there are times she's talking and I'm going, what is she talking? I look at Laura, what is she saying? I don't know. Is that English? And it's, she's just, I love my Newfoundland friends. Nelson, come on, buddy, right in there. I love my Newfoundland family. But how many of you know, sometimes they're talking and you just stand there and go, are we in the same tribe? <laughs> Do we have the same language? because we don't, and I can't pick on them because I have Laura and I, we have Scottish roots. Laura's mom, before she passed away, there were times she, when she would throw the brogue on and start talking, I would just, my eyes would glaze over and I'd go, I don't know what that is. And she goes, well, it's English. And I go, no, it's not. That's true in every culture, isn't it? Every language has that. And then some of you, you like to turn it on. So you like to dial it up so that those of us who don't understand it, we have to like lean in and like, and you love that when our faces get all screwed up because we don't understand. 
confusion reigns. What was God doing here? God recognized something. So don't, don't disconnect the two. God's plan was in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. I want you to move across the face of this earth. And I want you to fill the earth. And I want you to reproduce. And my blessing. And he said, I am blessing you that way. I want you to do that. And man had said, you know, I think I'd rather kind of come together. And so the Lord knew something. See, Genesis 11 is going to move us to Genesis 12. And in Genesis 12, God would call a man from the Ur of the Chaldees and say, I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your country. And I want to leave the people that you know and go to a land that you don't know. I want you to trust me. And from one person, God said, I'm going to raise up a nation and look up to the heavens and the stars. His, your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky or the sand on the seashore. And from that will come a nation, and out of that nation will come one tribe, and out of that one tribe will come one family, and from that one family will come a child in the shadow of the city of Jerusalem. And in the shadow of the city of Jerusalem, this child would be born in a manger in obscurity, and where everyone else is worried about fame and fortune and power and influence, this one child would grow in meekness, but he would strong in stature and spirit, and he would be the one to save us from our sins. Genesis 11 is not a picture of a God who felt rivaled by his creation. It is a picture of a God so desperately in love with his creation that he said, if the only way I can reach them is by changing their languages, then that's what I'll do. And you know the beautiful part of this story? That when you reach the book of Acts, if you're new to the Bible, when you reach the book of Acts and the Spirit is poured out, They began to speak in other tongues, and the Bible says that people from other nations were there in the city and could understand what was being said about Jesus because the Spirit gave utterance. See, God doesn't set something in motion without a purpose and a course of action, and that he initiated diversity so that one day that diversity would be a way for the Spirit to reach us with the message of Christ. And a day is coming where the Bible tells us that he will once again unify our language. But Revelation tells me this, that the nations of the world will gather around the throne and they will be worshiping in their language before the Lord. And as we continue in that relationship with him, God says, I will once again unify that language and bring it back together. God will take us back to paradise as long as we stay on course with his plan. Amen?